Let's talk about writing chemical formulas. Pull out your science notebook. Here's the essential question. How do we determine the chemical formulas of various substances? In order to write reaction equations, we need to be able to write the formulas of the various substances in the reaction. So let's get started. There are three substances we're going to need to consider. The first type of substance are elements. Now, elements can be just regular elements, or they could also be diatomic elements. The other type of substances we need to consider are compounds, and there are covalent and ionic compounds that we need to consider in this course. The last type of substance are acids, and we'll go through each of these and give some examples. Let's start with elements. Elements are the purest form of a substance, and we can find them on the periodic table. They're typically written using the element symbol. For example, here are aluminum, sodium, potassium, and iron, and their symbols. So in a chemical reaction, if we had one of these substances in their purest form, we could just write their symbols as you see on the periodic table. Now, there are a certain subset of elements called diatomic elements. This list right here includes the exact diatomic elements. Now, these elements are special because in their purest form, they have to be written with a little subscript of two. For example, if we had a reaction where hydrogen gas was reacting, we would write it as H2, not just H. The same goes for these other diatomic elements. Now, these elements are not diatomic when they are attached to other elements, such as the case with compounds. So let's talk about compounds. Compounds are just two or more different types of elements stuck together. Now, one type is a covalent compound. A covalent compound is a substance made of only non-metal elements. That's how we know a compound is a covalent compound. Now, when we know that, we know that we can determine how many of each element there are based on the prefix in the name of a covalent compound. Here are the list of prefixes, which are also found on your periodic table. And here are some examples to go along with that. One example of a covalent compound is carbon monoxide. Mono means one, so there's one oxygen. Now, carbon doesn't have a prefix because it's the first element. The fact that it's there means it's one. Mono, just so you know, is sometimes not used in covalent compounds, and sometimes it is, but it's always the second element that gets it, if so. Our second example is carbon dioxide. Similar to the first, it's made out of carbon and oxygen, but this time the prefix di on the oxygen mean that there are two of them. Diphosphorus pentasulfide is our third example. Diphosphorus means there's two, and then penta is five for the sulfurs. The other type of compound is an ionic compound. These are also substances made of multiple atoms, but this substances, these types of substances typically have a positive and a negative piece that are attached to each other. Usually the positive piece is a metal, and the negative piece are one or more nonmetals. Now, in order to put these substances together, the quantity of each positive and negative piece is determined by the ratio of charges that you need in order to neutralize the substance as a whole. That might seem a little complicated, but let's take a look at some examples. Our first example is sodium chloride. That's NaCl. The reason it's one sodium and one chlorine is because of their charges. Sodium's charge is positive one and chlorine's charge is minus one. Now you might be asking how we know what these charges are. I'll tell you in the next slide when we take a look at the periodic table. But because sodium is a positive one and chlorine's a minus one, you only need one ratio of each to cancel each other out. Calcium carbonate is another example. Calcium on the periodic table is plus two. Carbonate is a special substance called a polyatomic ion, and you would find these on the periodic table as well of a list of polyatomic ions. Carbonate's formula is CO3, and on the periodic table, that list shows us that its charge is minus 2. So again, the ratio of calcium and carbonate is 1 to 1 because their charges already cancel each other out. So calcium and carbonate CO3 are just attached to each other one, with a ratio of 1 to 1. Now, our third example does not have a ratio of one to one. Here we have iron to nitrate. Now, iron to the two Roman numerals represent the charge of the iron. So this iron has a positive two charge. And I'll talk about this on the next slide as well. But here, nitrate, another polyatomic ion from our list of polyatomic ions is NO3 with a charge of minus one. These charges are not equal, so we would need to determine the ratio of each in order to cancel each other out. In this case, iron being a positive charge, two charge, we only need one of them, so it's Fe. Nitrate, on the other hand, being a minus one charge, we would need two nitrates to counteract or neutralize that one iron. So our formula for iron two nitrate is FeNO32. That's two nitrates attached to one iron. 
Let's take a look at the periodic table. This is going to give us a bunch of hints of how to write some of these substances. Now, I talked about diatomic elements earlier, but our periodic table has a list of diatomic elements at the top. This will help it so you don't have to memorize these elements. Just realize that when you see them, again, in their purest form, they're up here. If these elements, on the other hand, are attached to any other elements, it kind of depends on if they're ionic or covalent, if they have a 2 or a different subscript. One thing you should know about the periodic table is that it's divided into metals and nonmetals. This is especially helpful for ionic compounds. This stair step right here divides the metals on the left side, which are typically positively charged, and nonmetals on the right side, which are negatively charged. Here in the middle, you might notice that some of the elements, like the red ones and the blue ones, don't have charges listed near them. These elements, the transition and other metals, typically use Roman numerals in their name to designate what their charges are. All of the other elements with standard charges don't need Roman numerals. As for these transition and other metals, there are five of them that also don't need Roman numerals. Silver, cadmium, zinc, gallium, and aluminum. You'll notice that their charges are listed, so those are standard charges. Now, in an ionic compound, if you just have two elements, a metal and a nonmetal, those names typically end in "-ide", so it's pretty easy to check their charges here on the periodic table. Polyatomic ions, as we mentioned before, you can recognize them in ionic compounds when there are more than two elements that are attached to each other, typically three or more. Sometimes in the name, we can also recognize them because... Some of them end in "-ide", but many of them also end in "-ate", or "-ite". But down here is a list of polyatomic ions. You can always look at the names and see if they're down here, and the charges are listed with them as well. Let's go ahead and do some practice. See if you can figure out what these problems are, and I challenge you to pause the video, but I'm going to go through them one by one for those students who might need help. The first example is dinitrogen monoxide. The first thing we need to do is determine whether it's ionic or covalent in order to know how to determine how many there are. This one is covalent because it's made of nitrogen and oxygen, and the prefix let us know how many there are. Typically, di is two, so there's two nitrogens, and mono means one, so there's one oxygen. Aluminum chloride is ionic. It's made of a metal and a nonmetal. Now, if I look on the periodic table, aluminum, when it bonds with other atoms, typically forms a positive three charge. So in this case, when it bonds with chlorine, it forms that positive three charge. Chlorine typically forms negative one charges when bonding with elements. So if we wanted to cancel these two out, we got to see have a ratio of one aluminum and three chlorines in order for that to work. So here's the formula for aluminum chloride. The next example, iron two chloride is also ionic. Iron is a metal and chlorine is again a nonmetal. Big hint to let us know that it's ionic. Now, iron here has a Roman numerals. If I try to look on the periodic table, it won't tell me what the charge is of iron. The Roman numerals, on the other hand, will. This particular ion in this formula has a positive 2 charge because of those Roman numerals. Chlorine still has a negative 1 charge. Again, these charges occur because these atoms are bonding with each other. So the ratio here is FeCl2. We need two chlorines attached to that one iron in order for all the charges to cancel each other out. The next, next example is calcium phosphate. Again, this is an ionic compound. Calcium is a metal. Phosphate is a polyatomic ion. One hint of that is that it ends in eight. But you can also look at the list of polyatomic ions, and you would see that list, that, that word or that name, phosphate, down there. Phosphate is PO4. That's how you write phosphate. And that entire group of elements has a charge of minus three. So we're going to keep it as a group with the entire charge. Calcium is a charge of plus two, so the ratio to put these together are three calciums, because three calciums would be positive six, and two whole phosphates, because two phosphates also charge would be negative six, and that's how they cancel each other out. The next example is a covalent compound, and it's sulfur hexafluoride. We know that because sulfur is a nonmetal, and fluorine is also nonmetal. Now, the prefix also kind of help us determine that this is a covalent compound because only covalent compounds get prefix in their name. So in this particular substance is SF6, one sulfur and six fluorines. The next example is barium hydroxide. This is an ionic compound. Barium is a metal. Hydroxide, it does end in "-ide", so I might go look at my list of nonmetals, but there's no such nonmetal called hydroxygen or anything like that. So this is a polyatomic ion. You do find hydroxide on that list, and it's OH. Now, barium's charge is plus 2. 
hydroxide's charge as a whole is minus one. So the ratio is one barium and two whole hydroxides. And this is the formula for barium hydroxide. Our last example is ionic. It's iron three carbonate. Iron ha here has a positive three charge and carbonate is a polyatomic ion. We see the word eight and we can find in the list as CO3. Based on their charges, they would be written, the whole compound would be written like this. Two irons and three carbonates all attached to each other. All right, last is acids. And quite frankly, they're really easy. If you look at the list of acids on our periodic table, it has all of the formulas written out for you. You just need to recognize to go and look at the list to have the formulas written. Let's put it all together. The whole point of this is to write chemical reaction equations. So let's write a chemical reaction equation. Here we have magnesium and hydrochloric acid that react to form magnesium chloride and hydrogen. I'm gonna go one by one and write each of these substances, thinking about all the little details and types of things we need to remember. The first is magnesium. Magnesium is just a periodic table element in its purest form, and it's not a diatomic element. So I'm just gonna write magnesium as Mg. Next is hydrochloric acid. Now remember, we just look at the list of acids to get what, what the formula is for the acid. And hydrochloric acid is HCl, easy enough. The next one is magnesium chloride. This is a compound and I recognize that it's an ionic compound because there's magnesium, which is a positive two metal and chlorine becomes a negative one nonmetal. So I need to worry about those charges and the ratio of each to cancel each other out here there needs to be two chlorines that attach to the magnesium in order for those charges to fully negate each other. Last is hydrogen. This is another pure element, but this pure element is special. It's diatomic, and we need to list it as H2 because of it. Now, this reaction is written well, but we're not quite finished. We talked in another module about balancing chemical reactions, and we need to balance this reaction as well. I'm gonna put a coefficient of two in front of hydrochloric acid in order to make sure that my reactants and my products both balance each other in terms of the quantity of elements. Balancing, by the way, is always the last step of a chemical equation. You need to make sure to write each of the substances correctly first, then you can balance the reaction by adding coefficients. All right, here's the final practice. See if you can figure this one out yourself. I challenge you to pause the video at this moment right now did you try it? I hope so. Let me go ahead and help those who might be struggling. Here is our reaction equation just written out in word form. So let's go piece by piece and write each of the substances. The first one is iron three oxide. That's an ionic compound because it's made of iron, which is a metal and oxygen, which is a nonmetal. So the charges here listed on the periodic table are important. And that helps us determine the ratio. Two irons and three oxygens will each cancel each other out. So they're all going to attach with each other. Next is carbon monoxide. This is a covalent compound because carbon and oxygen are both nonmetals. So we need to look at the prefix. This one's pretty easy because it's one carbon and one oxygen. Over on the product side, we see iron. This is just a typical standard element and it's not a diatomic element. So we're just gonna list iron as its element symbol. Last is carbon dioxide. This is a covalent compound. Again, we need to look at the prefix. This one is CO2 because one carbon and di for oxygen is two. All right, we wrote another reaction equation. Again, the last thing we need to do is balance it. So I'm gonna just show you the balanced coefficients for this. Again, if you need help with this, check out another module about balancing chemical reaction equations. That's the end of our notes. Take a moment and do these things. If you have any questions, be sure to seek out your instructor's help. Good luck.